Branaba Marielle Benjamins and all the national ministers who are present with us, as well as all the other leaders of the communities, including the MPs. Uh, I also want to recognize all the attendees who have joined us again on our second day. I'd like to quickly get to uh, some of the specific questions because we are short on time. One, when Dr. Salwa and Professor Tajal Kazin talked about the archives, perhaps a process for South Sudan uh, to begin to look for these archives and to build a library, uh, I wanted to echo that briefly, that that is imperative but I think the government of South Sudan do not, does not need to go to the government and independent sovereignty. You have the right to approach the United Kingdom government and you should be able to retrieve all those archives in such a way so that but you won't have to go to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the laboratory or to the libraries and so forth. This should be through the diplomatic relationship that exists between the two countries. One question as here is about the fact that some part or some of the states in South Sudan are experiencing extreme drought and famine and the question is what could be done about that in terms of short and long-term recommendation. So I will respond to that later after my presentation that deal with water management and that presentation is soon to come. So please uh, remind me if I forget that question and I want to save time for now. The question that I like to respond to is from uh, a gentleman from Unity and Dr. Salwa responded to that briefly, uh, and it is a concern that while water is life, it's also a source of death. Uh, sure, when you look around the world, you look at uh, tsunami in the United States, also in Japan, you realize how devastating it is both to human lives and to properties. And so no doubt that the manifestation of uh, climate change and variability has resulted to tremendous challenges around the world. And I did cover this quickly yesterday under the global challenges related to waters. So no doubt about the fact that these large scale flooding are causing lives. But at the same time, we also want to look at long range, uh, that our lives today as citizens of these uh, seven of the ten states is in, are in danger, and that we need to look at some of the short term and long terms. But we are also caring about the next generation and the next generation, and that is why it is important for us as a nation to pass, meaning to take a break and look at all possible options, comprehensive approach to what could be done to ensure that yes, we factored in the current challenges, but at the same time, we are taking a long range to some of the potential consequences that we are not seeing today, given the climatic change and variability. This is why modeling studies has been recommended here as a proper way to go so that we are able to see exactly whether this large scale flooding will persist in the next five years or 10. If it does persist in the next 10 or 15 years, therefore it will justify some of the major physical infrastructure to address it. But if the modeling does indicate that we will not have uh, such large scale flooding, but in a state that we may have the opposite of it, which is drought, then this is what will inform the infrastructure planning that we will have to pursue. So all of this is factored in. You are not, we are not looking at the debate of whether you belong to the camp of dredging or not. This is not our position. Our position is to look at this in a holistic 
uh, sense. So I hope that is clear. Uh, before I let the rest go, there is a qu uh, one point that I want to underscore here, and it is important. One of the individuals who has questioned today talked about or referred to uh, Professor Tash as a northern expert. I'm not sure what he meant, but I think it is important for me to emphasize something here. We are here as researchers, scientists, and knowledge, especially in the context of science, has no boundaries. If you discover something today in your village or in your county, it will be celebrated by the world and it will be welcomed by the world. And actually, whatever you discover and the finding and learning that emerge from your discovery will be applied somewhere in Japan, somewhere in the United Kingdom, somewhere in Brazil to resolve a specific problem that is related to that finding. So today, people are referred, if you want to refer somebody based on the regions, it got to be the region that they are specialized in. For example, if you are specialized in the region of Asia, or let's say Southeast uh, China Sea, you will be referred as an expert on the Asia region, an expert on South Sudan. And there are a lot of people who are experts on South Sudan. Either South Sudan in the context of hydrology, South Sudan in the context of anthropology, South Sudan in the context of its people and habitat. There are people who have written tremendous knowledge on us, and they are referred as experts on South Sudan. So please, uh, I am emphasizing this because I would not like to hear another comments that seem uh, to uh, resonate with uh, some uh, sub subtitles that uh, do not really uh, advance this uh, discussion. Thank you very much. I am actually, I am not offended at all. I am here for a much bigger reason, for a much bigger objective. I do not get offended whatsoever. People have got the freedom to say what they want. I will take what I want and I will leave what I don't want. One, one quick comment. All these are questions. Community consultations is not one way. We are not here to lecture you. We are here to interact with you. That's why your questions are as important as our presentations. And I ask and I beg of the organizing body to give us time to answer these questions. If it is bugging your head, it will continue bugging your head until it is clear. So we have to have enough time, really, to answer all the questions from the audience. Thank you. All right. So I think we are moving to my presentation. Uh, for all the questions to do with dredging, Professor Tach is going soon after me on the presentation is specifically on dredging. So we have uh, put them behind so that we all come back and answer those questions as soon as Professor Tach has presented on the theme or on the topic of dredging. I hope that is clear. Uh, our next presentation, again, is about the SAT ecosystem and socio-economic values and water resources management. I'd like to begin my research by just uh, taking a moment to recognize that we had a wonderful session yesterday, and today we hope to have another wonderful session. And want to reflect a little bit of the journey we have been. Uh, this uh, consult consultation forum has taken quite a bit of time and planning for us to be here. And I would like to take this moment to recognize the people who has made this happen. And it has happened after how many years? 2011, we are now in 2022. So that is around 11 years. And so we have to recognize that this is unprecedented events and we make best use of it. I'd like to thank His Excellency President Salfa Mayadi for initiating this uh, initiative and for inviting us to come here. And of course Dr. 
uh, Morella Benjamin for exercising the leadership and overseeing this initiative. We also want to thank our coach, our Queen Mamim, and his team, all of whom we have seen yesterday for their dedication. So it is important that all of us recognize the work that has been put into this, the logistic and the planning, as well as uh, the time we have spent to come here. And I hope this is the beginning. This is not an end. This is the beginning of a dialogue that I, we hope to translate into some action down the road. Uh, now, please, you can play the, the screen so that I get to the uh, presentation. All right, so Greek philosophers were in, so intrigued in the Nile that they believe its origins was not like that of other rivers, but it has been created along with the world. And for those of you who have read the Bible well, in the book of Genesis you realize that there were four rivers created along with the world. I believe the White Nile and the Blue Niles along with the Tigris and Euphrates were the four rivers that the Bible referred to. If you are curious about that, you can dig more and do if you are uh, curious about research. that. Research. My presentation is laid out in the following way, uh, referring to the short studies that I am recommending for the water resources as well as for the adaptation for the flooding. Medium term studies, again for the same reason, and then we have a long term studies that I am recommending. Why do we talk about water preservation? It is important that water preservation give the population the rights and benefit to use or to utilize such water for an end goal, and that is human development. We are talking about insecurity related to water insecurity and food security. And so this is an overall vision that South Sudan can be able to use its water for socio-economic transformation through industrialization, for example, uh, coupled with adaptation of large-scale agricultural industry to win the population of subsistence farming, which is 80% or more of all South Sudanese. Now, let us pass a look at the South, such wealth and blessing. And all of, all of us already had a lot about this, so I will not uh, lease all of the ecosystem services, but I will hint it to a very few of them that I believe are so important. The South Wellands is one of the world's most unique and valuable ecosystems. And of course, this is the African largest fresh water wetlands, and this is important. Fresh water is like gold. It's rare to go around the world today and find an ecosystem like such with fresh water. The South wetland is potentially the greatest economic asset, and it has been noted by a number of writers in the literature. Potential contribution has been estimated as one billion US dollars per year. The estima estimation was done through a formula called the transfer uh, formula. This was using the valuation of both the Okavango Delta in South, in, 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 in South Africa, as well as the Zambezi uh, Basin. These two basins are well managed, and the eco uh, tourism and eco uh, value has been estimated. And SAT were, the estimation of SAT was based on that. Also, SAT provides seasonal refuge to the wildlife, again, between the Buma Plateau and the SAT region. We, you have heard about groundwater earlier on, and groundwater recharge is also estimated here to be 2.1 million US dollars. How does the groundwater come about? It is important to know that it's not only from the rain, but most of the groundwater within the such regions comes as a function of a recharge that comes seasonally from the such basin with its seasonal flooding. And when the such basin, for example, is compromised, that means the groundwater could also be compromised. This is part of the comprehensive look 
of the kind of study that we would like to recommend. We also look at another value that was mentioned yesterday, even by some of the official who spoke, and it is the carbon sequestration. We estimated at 14.4 million US dollars to 240 million dollars. What about the wildlife refuge that the SAT uh, does every year? Estimated to be 15.4 million US dollars per year. There is also something called water purification that happened naturally in the side basin. Here is, here is one way for me to explain water purification as one of the ecosystem services of the site. All of you know that for many years, centuries, the communities in the site basin, and these are millions population, have actually lived. And they have lived without any latrines or toilet. We are talking now about sanitation and water. But what happens? Because of the sad seasonal cycles, diseases that could have emanated from uh, open uh, usage of uh, human waste has reduced because of the role of the sad. And that role is called water purification every year. That is an important role that the sad has produced. I'm not sure today if all of these communities and all of these populations have access to modern latrine and toilet, it is also part of the research that needs to be factored in. There is also income from research and education activities, and this is connected to the UNESCO designation of the site as Ramsar because of its uniqueness and because of its potential scientific uh, research related to it, and the kind of drugs that could come from the unique habitat, vegetations, and these pieces that are not common or even existing in the rest of the world. The idea of preserving an ecosystem in the world origin originates with the fact that, that whatever is found in that habitat is so unique that it may not exist anywhere else, and then there is a need for the world to preserve it. Not all of it, of course. This, uh, this is not a point to say that it can be preserved all of it at the expense of human life. But that there is a solution and innovation that will ensure that the permanent uh, size of the site could be preserved to ensure that those special species are preserved, but at the same time that human life is preserved. Now there are threats. I talked briefly about this yesterday. One of the threats is major drainage project that could be proposed. The other threat is logging and illegal poaching of wildlife, oil exploration are another threat. I was not able yesterday to play these uh, images, so I have the opportunity to play them today. If you can go to the next slide, there is, yes. This is, um, this is the flat risk. You can see the darker the color, the more risk the uh, flat in that particular region, and all of you know the map of South Sudan. You can see the dark one represents extremely high, the lighter dark is high, then orange, medium high, and yellow, low resolution. Like you can see now next to the border of DRC in Western uh, Equatoria and Western Bahar Khazad, you can see that yellow. It means that that area has low or low medium flat risk, but the rest of the country, look at the middle of it. Look at the border next to where Sudan, even the United States we were talking about today and Jongule and Hapanal that are submerged in the water today have this potential risk. This does not imply, and again, I don't want to be misunderstood, this does not imply that we don't need to have a quick solution today to ensure human survival and human livelihood. But it does mean that let us take a long range planning to ensure that we have a solution for today and also a solution for tomorrow. These are images of the flooding. Some of them were taken from Unity State. Look at them. These images are so mind-boggling. It 
telling you what these people are going through. We need a solution for flooding. No, no, no doubt about that. And it is important for everyone to understand that this is a human survival crisis that needs a solution. But science does take a break and look at the long range, and especially the role of climatic change that is uh, quite unpredictable. This is a uh, 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 story about the confusion. The other, the other uh, let me go back. This was the flood, I'm sorry. This was the flood. This was the flood. And whatever I explained before, the opposite of it is the case of the flooding. But here is the drought. You, you see, again, we are going in the opposite direction. The red or uh, dark red is extremely high around the country. That is to the uh, eastern Equatoria. You see that? You go to the upper Nile north. You go to uh, Unity State, I believe, north. So that is the sign of flood uh, of, of drought. It's not too much from what I explained, except that I uh, I, I sort of uh, in, uh, exchange them. Now this is the f this is the image that I really want to show, and especially to our MPs and officials who happen to be with us. It is important to note that oil exploration and the potential pollution it can do to the salt water and fresh water cannot be underscored. Look at all, uh, oh yes, look at all the major oil field right within the site. You look at the boundary, the green one, uh, that is the boundary of the site originating from Jipo going all the way to Malakal. When you see the colors are not so great, but when you see the colors, there is a, a purple color. That purple color is producing blocks, the blocks in oil that are now producing. And the uh, block bit round one uh, color that is red blue a uh, licensed block that can operate any time but the whole lesson is this that the, uh, the oil is within the sun and they require very serious and careful revaluation with all the oil companies and the countries that are involved in order to save life oil is filled in the sad basin, this is oil fields, and this is going to encroach into the idea of sad and water, human life, postural life. I showed you this yesterday, so I won't go too much into it, but this is an environmental flow within the sad, how all the ecosystem interact, humans, a system, a natural system, as well as animals, kingdom, how all of that interact is brought into this graph. Now, there is a question about humans here, and especially those humans that have been displayed, called the environmental refugees. One concept is called the managed retreat. Managed retreat is actually an attention paid to individuals and communities that have been displaced. So that is not a issue of space. The space is where you move people, let's say in this case, from um, one part of the state to another, or from one state to another. In the case of Jongule, Hapanai, the Unity State, a lot of people have moved to Lake State. They have also moved to uh, Central Equatorial State. Some have moved outside the country, perhaps to Kenya and to Uganda. It is important to look at these people in their contact with the places they have been. The places have been identity to them. They have emotional attachment to them social attachment to them, other values that cannot be seen. It is important that some of our studies look at all of that, what it means for human to be displaced. We are also, we are also using a concept called social eco hydrological concept. This is a concept that in the case of SAC, that ensure that we have to have the understanding of hydrology as a evolve of the SAC. But not only that, again the human element come in, that we also have to look at such a system of the sun in order to have the potential intervention and the governance structure, all of these are brought in together. The legal aspect that were presented today, the social aspect, the hydrological aspect, all of that need to be factored in in these studies in order to come up with a long-term solution. 
these dynamics that are depicted in this uh, uh, framework, for example, uh, in the case of socio-ecological agenda, we are looking at what are called connectivity, primarily addressing biophysical aspect and governance, which focuses on changes in the human social system over time. We are also looking at what they call metabolisms and vulnerability. This is relating now to how humans have become vulnerable to the national system. And we need to look back. These communities are very smart. They have lived with this natural phenomenon over centuries. When we are doing research, we are not coming to say that there are no wizards. Research are not wizards. They don't come with magical solution. Solution can be found within the population who have lived in these places and have some life experience and wisdom that then is factored in into a research into how they are navigating this. The, we are also looking at energy, resources, and associated with risks and impacts. Look at this uh, image if you can, uh, yes. This is the all the system. You look at natural system on your left and such a system on your right. And the connectivity that I was referring to, one of them is vulnerability, the governance. Don't leave out the governance. And the research that we are talking about cannot be top down, bottom, where the government come with a solution and then force it. No. This research should be inclusive in the sense that the national government, government is structure, the state government is structure, the counties are part of this, as well as the traditional system. All of that are part of the government structure. And how that informs the natural system and how the natural system in turn inform the social system. This is a framework from my own study. Uh, the next slide. In the middle, you may not see it clearly, but right in the center, the bigger oval shape, sustainable development of the SAT. It means that if we are going to have a sustainable development of the SAT, in this diagram and this framework, on the left, you, look, you have to look at the Harper Nile and the SAT climate change. At the bottom, you have to look at transboundary water management issues eloquently addressed by Dr. Salwa today. On the top, you look at the site eco-hydrology. And then on the right, you look at the flood risk, which are the current problem we have, and the infrastructure. When all of these four uh, pieces, are components are brought together, this is where you would arrive at the sustainable development of the site that recognize all of these important components. And when you are doing modeling that I was referring to the other day, you could move to the next slide. You can look at the same thing depicted in this way. You look at the big orange arrow coming from the top right. That is social technical intervention. If you are calling for intervention, dredging, for example, or dams, you are going to put in a simulation. That then in turn get into the sad area and will also show the impact. One of the things we also need to be aware of is something called maladaptation. Maladaptation is when you come with a solution to resolve the problem today, but then after a year or so you wake up to realize that the solution you have uh, instituted or implemented a year ago has now become a new problem and has, is now creating more social problems that you need to control. That is part of the modeling so that you can model and simulate the impacts of your intervention, social impact, so that you have a plan to mitigate those impacts if you go ahead with such a planning. All of this goes in into development policy. That then has to be reduced to analytical-based development design. Now I come to the conclusion and recommendation. I have been running through this just to make sure I save time. Uh, but let me pass and be a little slower when I come to recommendation. On the current flooding, we, the, 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 the overall planning is really to perform a comprehensive assessment of the flood control options in the context of sustainable development, as I said. And such approach should include the affected population, government officials, as I indicated, or various governments. And then it also requires, as I underscored yesterday, 
that for South Sudan to realize that water is important and human life is important in terms of drought and flooding, you have to, the Council of uh, Ministers, I appeal to them, they should pass a budget, a budget that is within the vicinity of 10 to 15 percent allocated to water resources management. If you have that budget, you will be able to, to, to sponsor a research a research that will, be, that will produce knowledge that South Sudan is proud and own it so that you have your own data instead of depending on the data produced by other countries, for example. A uh, short term is study for, this is now where the question from Unity State come in and happen island young way. In the meantime, South Sudan is a big country and when we have crisis in one part of the country, it should be the crisis for the entire country. All the environmental refugees displaced from one state must be welcome in other states because we are dealing with crisis. Therefore, one recommendation is that relocation program. But that relocation program needs to be funded so that it is viable, so that it supports human lives in that transition. It cannot just be left alone to the affected population to relocate. That relocation program is a national pro project that needs to be funded. People move across the space. The other solution is that we need to invest <coughs> in, again, locations where these communities that are housing or that are receiving the environmental refugees for example, in the case of Mangala, here in central Equatoria, that is housing number of refugees from Jongle. And in the case of uh, uh, Lake State, that are also housing refugees, uh, we call them environmental refugees, but they are displaced, let's call them uh, IDPs from the other state. These are South Sudanese citizens. But these communities and this state that are housing this uh, displaced population also need to be supported. And there is also need to be a program to ensure that there is a coexistence and that, that we don't have new crises that are emerging from the interaction of the IDPs and the communities. We also need to, uh, to embed. I, re I see a former mayor of a Boer uh, town here. Uh, uh, Dr. Mach Majer. He worked so hard on some of the flood initiative uh, in Bo Town. We had not met in person until yesterday, but I have followed up what he did. So dikes, for example, are important for this. So if we continue to build dikes a little higher, safer dikes around Key Town, but when we are building these dikes, we should also be mindful of impact downstream because you could build a cave to protect a town, but then where is this water going? You need to be aware that they could also have an impact to the people downstream. We also, I also recommend that there should be construction of minor channelization. You try to look at channels that exist before and create a, uh, and, and dig them shallow so that you can direct the water flow. Uh, on the medium term, continue to invest on the relocation program, continue to invest on the dikes and the embankments on a specific strategic part of the bank. Digging and renovation, this is one of my major recommendations. South Sudan need to renovate the Fuller Dam. Fuller Dam need to be constructed, and it has two purposes. It can help with hydropower and also modulate the flow of the water, and it need to be made a little bigger now, pending the assessment need to be done. A little bigger, a little deeper, and it can serve those two purposes. And it is probably one of the only places that have water velocity when we talk about the full waterfall. And we cannot, it has to be that year. It cannot be, uh, it cannot be uh, emphasized enough. Now, again, all of us here, Professor Taj, Dr. Salu and I, and our colleagues here in South Sudan who are an expert, we recommend National Water Commission to be instituted either by the Agro Parliament or 
executive order of the presidents because the knowledge that we are beginning to produce will have to have a generational impact. Young people that are going to school in all the universities in the country and outside the country need to have a pipeline through which they have access, through which they have this knowledge. This institution, when it is instituted, the commission, it will then enable the research institute within the government. The government of South Sudan now does not have a research institute. The, every government in the world has a research institute. And if water is so important like this, it has to have a research institute. This research institute now will give the students of South Sudan an opportunity to get to study all the aspects of the water. And when they have this study done in the next 20 or even 15 years, we will have a knowledge base. We will, this room will be full of experts in all of the aspects of the water we are talking about. And when we have that room of experts, we will export them to the rest of the, uh, of the region, to the rest of the country, to teach the world about water. We will be the expert of the world. What we are doing today will be the reverse of what we are talking about. The other big recommendations, and some of you have read my writing or my presentation as well, realize that I have proposed an artificial lake. An artificial lake is proposed here in the triangular, in the triangular area of the Upper Nile, the Jungle Lake, as well as the uh, Peach Board Administrative Area. I tried to do this because my proposal is not connected to the tributaries of the Nile that originated from the Equatorial Lake. It is meant to capture the water runoff coming from the Boomer Mountain and going all the way down to the Depression. Water is coming from the Peach Board area, water coming from the whole catchment from runoff. And when you have artificial lake, it will capture that water from the rain. South Sudan should partner with international research groups and leading institutions as we speak to be able to, 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 to build the institutional capacity we are talking about today. This is an image that I showed yesterday. Uh, it is hydro meteorological model. This is the kind of modeling uh, that we are talking about that will project how the entire South Basin will behave as to whether it will, how it will respond to climatic change and variability in many years to come to inform us. The artificial lake that I'm talking about at this point is at conceptual level. It is a, a 